Professor Derrida teaches at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and he has come regularly to various universities in the United States. But Derrida, it is no exaggeration to say that you are one of the very few thinkers in Europe today who have truly taken philosophy a step ahead. We have taken it even beyond an edge where many connotations attached to the word philosophy have fallen into an abyss, including the most consoling ones. With you, one feels no longer sure whether a step ahead is not a step back, <laughs> or a step aside into the margins of philosophy, perhaps a dance step around it. In my judgment, there is no other thinker alive who has taken upon himself the task of laboring through Durcharbeiten, the history of philosophy, with as great a learning and as clear a strategy as yours. Many of those, both uh, in this country and abroad, who have learned most from you are in literature departments. There are, to be sure, profound reasons for that situation. It is nonetheless somewhat perplexing, since I do not see how one can approach your numerous and complex publications without a deep and detailed knowledge of the major texts since antiquity. To extract some key words from your writings, turn them into a slogan and call that a method of literary criticism, has always seemed to me an escape from the more demanding task that you propose and impose on us, namely, to read the tradition anew with an eye to the chinks and cracks in its edifices. Rereading philosophy in the light and in the shadow and with the headaches that we owe you, <laughs> we start being unsure whether the philosopher ever actually was what he was supposed to be, namely the prime civil servant who guaranteed ultimate reasons, sanity of mind, and coherence of systems of authority. For that reminder of our extreme finitude, which I take as true emancipation, as radical enlightenment. Thank you. Professors, uh, Professor Derrida's paper tonight is entitled The Principle of Reason and the Politics of the University. Thank you for being here. Today, uh, how can we not speak of the university? I put my, put my question in the negative for two reasons. On the one hand, as we all know, it is impossible, now more than ever, to dissociate the work we do within one discipline or several from a reflection on the political and institutional conditions of that work. Such a reflection is unavoidable. It is no longer an external complement to teaching and research. It must take its way through the very objects we work with, shaping them as it goes, along with our norms, procedures, and aims. We cannot not speak of such things. On the other hand, the question, how can we not, gives notice of the negative, or perhaps we should say preventive, complexion of the preliminary reflections, I should like to put to you. Indeed, since I'm seeking to initiate discussion, I shall content myself with saying how one should not speak of the university. Some of the typical risks to be avoided, it seems to me, take the form of a bottomless pit, while others take the form of a protectionist barrier. Does the university today have what is called a raison d'être? I've chosen to put my question in a phrase, raison d'être, literally, reason to be, which is quite uh, idiomatically, idiomatically French. In two or three words, that phrase, raison d'être, names everything I shall be talking about. Reason and being, of course, and the essence of the university in its connections to reason and being, but also the cause, purpose, direction, necessity, 
justification, meaning and mission of the university. In a word, its destination. To have a raison d'etre, a reason for being, is to have a justification for existence, to have a meaning, an intended purpose, a destination, but also to have a cause, to be explainable according to the principle of reason. Uh, reason, in terms of reason, which is also a, gr a cause, a ground, and grund. That is to say also a footing and a foundation, a ground to stand on. In the phrase raison d'être, that idea of causality takes on above all the sense of final cause in the wake of Leibniz, the author of the foundation, and it was much more than a foundation, the principle of reason. To ask whether the university has a reason for being is to wonder why there is a university. With, uh, but the question why verges on with a view to what? The, the university with a view to what? What is the university's view of pupils? Starting with its first words, metaphysics associates sight with knowledge, and knowledge with knowing how to learn and knowing how to teach. I'm referring, of course, to Aristotle's metaphysics. I shall return presently to the political import of its opening lines. For the moment, let us look at the very first sentence. Pantes anthropoi to aidenai oregontai say. All men, by nature, have the desire to know. Aristotle thinks he sees a sign, semeion, a sign of, of this, in the fact that sensations give pleasure, even, quote, even apart from their usefulness, choriste creas. The pleasure of useless sensations explains explain the desire to know for the sake of knowing the desire for knowledge with no practical purpose. And this is more true of sight than of, of the other senses. We give preference to sensing through the eyes, not only for taking actions, pratein, but even when we have no practice in view. This one sense, naturally theoretical and contemplative, goes beyond practical usefulness and provides us with more to know than any other. Indeed, it unveils countless differences for las de loy diaphoras. We give preference to sight just as we give preference to the uncovering of differences. Difference. But is sight enough? For learning and teaching, does it suffice to know how to unveil differences? In certain animals, sensations, say that as sensation engenders memory, and that makes them more tronimotera, more intelligent, and more capable of learning, mathematicotera. But for knowing how to learn, and learning how to know, sight, intelligence, and memory are not enough. We must also know how to listen, how to hear, hear. I uh, might suggest somewhat carefully that we have to know how to shut our eyes in order to be better listeners. Bees know many things, since they can see, but they cannot learn, since they are among the animals that lack the faculty of hearing. I shall say. Thus, despite, despite appearances to the contrary, the university, the place where people know how to learn and learn how to know, can never be a kind of hive. Aristotle, let's not in passing, has ushered in a long tradition of frivolous remarks in the philosophical commonplace of the bee, uh, the sense and the senses of the bee, and the bee's reason for being. <laughs> Marx, Marx was doubtless not the last to have overworked that purpose when he insisted on distinguishing human in industry from animal in industry, as exemplified in bee society. Seeking such nectar 
as may be gathered from the past anthology of philosophical bees, I find a remark of Schilling's in his lessons on the method of academic study more to my taste. An allusion to the sex of bees often comes to the aid of the rhetoric of naturalism, organicism, or vitalism, that it plays upon the theme of the complete and interdisciplinary unity of knowledge, the theme of the university as an organic social system. This is the, in the most classic tradition of interdisciplinary studies. I quote Schelling. Schelling says, the aptitude, the aptitude for doing thoughtful work in the specialized sciences, the capacity to work in conformity with that higher inspiration which is called scientific genius, depends upon the ability to see each thing, including specialized knowledge, in its cohesion with what is originary and unified. Any thought which has not been formed in this spirit of unity and totality, the Einheit, Einheit, is empty in itself and must be challenged whatever is incapable of fitting harmoniously within that body, living totality, is a dead shoot which sooner or later will be eliminated by organic laws. Doubtless there also exists within the realm of science numerous sexless bees, who, since they, are, they have not been granted the capacity to create, multiply in, in, in organic shoots the outward signs of their own witnesses, witnessness, the eigenic eyes closing I don't know what bees, not only deaf but sexless, sexless Shelley had in mind at time, but I'm sure that even today such rhetorical witness would find many uh, an eager buyer. <laughs> One professor has recently written that a certain theoretical movement was mostly supported within the university by homosex homosexuals and feminists, the part of which seemed very significant to him and doubtless the sign of uh, asexuality. <laughs> Opening the eyes to know, closing them, or at least listening, in order to know how to learn and to learn how to know, here we have the first sketch of the rational animal. If the university is an institution for science and teaching, does it have to go beyond memory and thought? In what rhythm? To hear better and learn better, must it close its eyes or narrow its outlook? In cadence and in what, what cadence? Shut it off sight in order to learn is of course only a figurative manner of speaking. No one will take it literally. And I'm not proposing to cultivate an art of blinking. <laughs> and I'm resolutely in favor of new university of Cleon enlightenment. Still, I shall run the risk of extending my figuration a little farther in Aristotle. Aristotle in his period Fuques, he distinguishes between man and those animals that have hard, dry eyes, tons of the animals lacking eyelids, that sort of sheath or pigmental membrane, hagma, which serves to protect the eye and permits it at regular intervals to close itself off in the darkness of inward thought of sleep. What is terrifying about an animal which, with half eyes and a dry glance is that it always sees. Man can lower the sheath, adjust the diaphragm, narrow his sight, the better to listen, remember and learn. What might the university's diaphragm be? The university must not be a sclerophthalmic animal, a, a hard-eyed animal. When I asked a moment ago how it should set its sights and adjust its views, that was another way of asking about its reasons for being and its essence. What American English calls the faculty, those who teach, is in French le corps enseignant, the teaching corps, just as we say, the diplomatic core, or teaching body. 
So the question is, what can the university's body see or not see of its own destination, or that in view of which it stands its ground? Is the university the master of its own diaphragm? As far as I know, nobody has ever founded a university against reason. So we may reasonably suppose that the university's reason for being has always been reason itself and some essential connection of reason to being. But what is called the principle of reason is not simply reason. We cannot for now plunge into the, into the history of reason, its, its words and its concepts. The puzzling scene of translation which has shifted logos to ratio, to raison, reason, grund, ground, verbunft, and so on. What for three centuries now has been called the principle of reading was thought out and formulated several times by Leibniz. His most often quoted statement holds that nihil est sine ratione, se nullus effectus sine causa. Nothing without reason, no effect is without cause. According to Heidegger, the only formulation Leibniz himself considered authentic, authoritative, and rigorous is found in the late essay Specimen Inventorum. Quote, there are two first principles in all reasoning, the principle of non-contradiction, of course, and the principle of rendering, rendering reason. The second principle, says that for any truth, which means for any true proposition, that is, a reason the count is possible. Only veritatis redi ratio potest. Or to translate more literally, for any true proposition, reason can be rendered. Beyond all those big philosophical words, reason, truth, principle, that generally command attention, the principle of reason also, also holds that reason must be rendered. In French, the expression corresponding to Leibniz's redere rationem is rendre raison de quelque chose. It means to explain or account for something. But what does render mean with respect to reason? Could reason be something that gives rise to exchange, circulation, borrowing, debt? donation, restitution, but in that case, who would be responsible for that debt or duty? And to whom? In the phrase, redere rationem, ratio, ratio is not the name of a faculty of power, logos, ratio, reason, vernunft, that is generally attributed by metaphysics to man, so on, logos, the con, the rational animal. If we, have, if we had more time, we would follow the out Leibniz's interpretation of the synaptic shift which leads from the re ratio of the principium redende rationis, principle of rendering reason, to reason as the rational faculty. And in the end, to Kant's definition of reason as the faculty of principles. In any case, if reason in the principle of reason is not the rational faculty of, of power, that does not mean it is a thing encountered somewhere among the beings and the objects of the world, in the world, which must be rendered up, or given back. The question of this reason cannot be separated from a question about the modal verb must and the phrase must be rendered. The must seems to cover the essence of our relationship principle. It seems to mark out for us the, the, the requirement, debt, duty, request, command, obligation, law, the imperative. Whenever reason can be rendered, redi potest, it must. Can we, without further precautions, call this a moral imperative in the Kantian sense of pure practical reason? It is not clear that the sense of practical as it is determined by a critical, pure practical reason, gets to the bottom of the must or reveals its origin. Although such a critique has to presuppose such a must, the must of the principle of reason. It could be shown, I think, that the critical practical reason 
continually calls on the principle of will, on its must, which, although it is certainly not of a theoretical order, is nonetheless not simply practic practical or ethical in the Kantian sense. Uh, responsibility <laughs> is involved here, however. We have to respond to the call of the principle of reason. In Gazat from Grund, the principle of reason, Heidegger names that call Anspruch, requirement, claim, request, demand, command, convocation. It always entails a certain addressing of speech. The word, the word is not seen, it has to be heard and listened to. This apostrophe that enjoins us to respond to the principle of reason. A question of responsibility, to be sure. But is answering to the principle of reason the same act as answering for the principle of reason? Is the sea the same? Is the landscape the same? And where is the university located within this space? To respond to the call of the principle of reason is to render reason, to explain effects through their causes, rationally. It is also to ground, to justify, to account for on the basis of principles, archive, or rules, Ritza. Keeping in mind that Leibnizian woman, whose, whose originality should not be underestimated, the response to the call of the principle of reason is thus a response to the Aristotelian requirements, those of metaphysics, of primary philosophy, of the search for roots, principles and causes. At this point, scientific and techno-scientific requirements lead back to a common origin. And one of the most insistent questions in Heidegger's meditation is indeed that of the long incubation, is his word, incubation time, that separated this origin from the emergence of the principle of reason in the 17th century. Not only does that principle constitute the verbal formulation of a requirement present since the dawn of Western science and philosophy, it provides the impetus for a new era of reportedly modern reason, metaphysics and technoscience. And one cannot think the possibility of the modern university, the one that is restructured in the 19th century, in all the Western countries, without inquiring into that event, that institution of the principle of reason. But to answer for the principle of reason, and that's for the university, to answer for this call, to raise questions about the origin or ground of this principle of foundation, because that's what we do, is not simply to obey, to obey it, or to respond in the face of this principle. We do not listen in the same way when we are responding to a science as when we are questioning its meaning, its origin, its possibility, its goal, its limits. Are we obeying the principle of reason when we ask what grounds this principle, which is itself a principle of grounding? We are not, which does not mean that we are disobeying it either. Are we dealing here with a circle or with an abyss? The circle would consist in seeking to account for reason by reason, to render reason to the principle of reason, in appealing to the principle in order to make it speak of itself, at the very point where, according to Heidegger, the principle of reason says nothing about reason itself. The abyss, the whole, the, the abgrund, would be the impossibility for a principle of grounding to ground itself. This very grounding, like the university, would have to hold itself suspended above the most peculiar void. Are we to use reason to account for the principle of reason? Is the reason for reason rational? Is it rational to worry about reason and its principles, its principle? Not simply, <clears throat> but it would be over hasty to seek to disqualify this concern 
and to refer those who experience it back to their own irrationalism, their obscurantism, their nihilism. Who is more faithful to reason's call? Who hears it with a keener ear? Who better sees the difference? The one who offers questions in return and tries to think through the possibility of that summons, or the one who does not want to hear any question about the reason of reason. This is all played out along the path of the Heideggerian question, in a subtle difference of tone or stress, according to the particular words emphasized in the formula nihile est sine ratione. This statement has two different implications according to whether nihil and sine are stressed or est and ratione. I shall not attempt here, given the, the limits of this talk, to pursue all the reconnings involved in this shift of emphasis. Nor shall I, nor shall I attempt, uh, among other things and for the same reasons, to reconstitute a dialogue between, let's say Heidegger and, for example, Charles Sander Peirce, a strange and necessary dialogue and the com compound theme, indeed, of the university and the principle of reason. In a remarkable essay on uh, the limits of professionalism, that is the title, uh, The Limits of Professionalism, Samuel Weber quotes first, who in 1900, in the context of a discussion on the role of higher edu education in the United States, concludes as follows, quote uh, Charles Sander Pitt Peirce. Only recently have we seen an American man of science and of weight discuss the purpose of education without once alluding to the only motive that animates the genuine scientific investigator. I am not guiltless in this matter myself, for in my youth I wrote some articles to uphold a doctrine called pragmatism, namely that the meaning and essence of every con conception lies in the application that is to be made of it. Oh. That is all very well, when properly understood. I do not intend to recant it, but the question arises, what is the ultimate application? And at that time, I seem to have been inclined to subordinate the conception to the act, no knowing to doing. Subsequent experience of life has taught me that the only thing that is really desirable without a reason for being so is to render ideas and things reasonable. One cannot well demand one cannot well demand a reason for reasonableness reasonableness itself. Unquote. To bring about such a dialogue between Peirce and Heidegger, we would have to go beyond the conceptual opposition between concept conception and act, between conception and application, theoretical view and praxis, theory and technique. This passage beyond is sketched out briefly by Peirce in the very moment of this of his dissatisfaction. Why? He said, what might the ultimate application be? What Peirce only outlines is the path where Heidegger feels the most to be at stake, especially in the Satsang one. Being unable to follow this path myself here in the way uh, I have attempted to follow it elsewhere, I shall merely draw from it two assertions at the risk of oversimplifying. First, the modern dominance of the principle of reason had to go hand in hand with the interpretation of the essence of beings as objects, an object present as representation, for Stalin, an object placed and positioned before a subject. This latter, a man who says I, an ego certain of itself, thus ensures his own technical mastery over the totality of what is, the re of re re representatio, representatio, representation, the re of representation also expresses the movement that accounts for renders reason to a thing whose presence is encountered by rendering it present, by bringing it to the subject of representation, to the knowing itself. This would be the place, if we only had the time, to consider the way Heidegger makes 
the language do its work. The interaction, for instance, between Begegnen and Gegen, Gegenstein, Gegenwart on the one hand, and Stellen, Vorstellen, Zustellen on the other hand. This relation of representation, which is, which in its whole extension is not merely a relation of knowing, has to be grounded, ensured, protected. That is what we are told by the principle of reason, that's the good. The dominance is thus assured for representation, for forstelling, for the relation to the object, that is, to the being that is located before a subject, that says, I, and assures itself of its own present existence. But this dominance of the being before does not reduce to that of sight or of theoria, nor even to that of a metaphor of the optical and indeed sclerophthalmic dimension. It is in their Satz und Grund that Heidegger states all his reservations on the very presupposition of such rhetoricizing interpretations. It is not a matter of distinguishing it here between sight and non-sight, but rather between two ways of thinking of sight and of light, as well as between two conceptions of listening and voice. But it is true that a caricature of representation, representational man, in the Heideggerian sense, would readily endow him with hard eyes permanently open to a na nature that he is to dominate, to rape if necessary by fixing it in front of himself, or by swooping down on it like a bird of prey. The principle of reason installs it, its empire only to the extent that the abyssal question of the being that is hiding with it remains, remains hidden, and with it the question of the grounding of the ground itself, of grounding as grunden, to ground, to give or take ground, bottom name, as begründen, to motivate, justify, authorize, or especially as stiften, to erect or institute, a meaning to which Heidegger recalls a certain preeminence. My second point, that now that institution of modern technoscience, that is, the university stiftung institution, is built both on the principle of reason, and on what remains hidden in that principle. As if in passing, in, it, in two passages that are important for us, Heidegger asserts that the modern university is grounded, grounded, built, about, on the principle of reason. It rests, root, on this principle. But if today's university, locus of modern science, is grounded on the principle of grounding, that is on reason, grounded of them, that's grounded. Nowhere do we encounter within it the principle of reason itself. Nowhere is this principle thought through, scrutinized, interrogated as to its origin. Nowhere within the university as such is anyone wondering from where that call, Anspruch, of reason is voiced? Nowhere is anyone inquiring into the origin of that demand for grounds, for reason that is to be provided, rendered, delivered. Woher spricht dieser Anspruch des Grundes auf seine Zustände? And this dissimulation of its origin within what remains unthought is not harmful, quite the contrary to the development of the modern university. Indeed, Heidegger, in passing, makes certain laudatory remarks about that university, progress in sciences, in the sciences, its militant interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity, its discursive zeal, and so on. But all this is elaborated above an abyss, suspended over a gorge by which we mean on grounds whose own grounding remains invisible and unthought. And that means at the same time proposition and, and a leap. Having reached this point in my reading, instead of involving you 
in a micrological study of hydrogels, as that's what we want, or of his earlier texts on the university, in particular his inaugural lesson of 1929, or the rector's speech of 1933. These have to be helped in the Dutch University, study which I'm attempting as well in Paris. Instead of meditating at the edge of the abyss, I prefer to return to a certain concrete actuality in the problem that assail us in the universe. The framework of grounding, of foundation, and the dimension of the fundamental impose themselves on several counts in the space of the universe, whether we are considering the question of its reason for being in general, or its specific missions, or the politics of teaching and research. Each time, what is at stake is the principle of reason as principle of grounding, foundation, or institution. A major debate is in the way today on the subject of poli the politics of research and teaching, and on the role that the university may play in this arena. Collaborative, uh, whether this role is central or marginal, progr progressive or decadent, collaborative with or independent of that of other research institutions, sometimes considered better suited to certain ends. The term of this debate tend to be analogous. I'm not saying that they are identical. Analogous in all the highly industrialized countries, whatever the political regime, whatever role the state traditionally plays in this arena. And we all know even the Western democracies vary considerably in this respect. In the so-called developing countries, the problem takes shape according to models that are certainly different, but in all events inseparable from the preceding ones. Such a problematics cannot always, cannot any longer, be reduced to a problematics centered on the nation state. It is now centered, instead, on multinational military industrial complexes, or techno-economic networks, or rather international techno-military networks that are apparently multi- or transnational in form. In France, for some time, this debate has been organized around what is called the orientation, finalisation of research. Oriented research, research finalisé. Oriented research is research that is pro programmed, focused, organized in an authoritarian fashion in view of, in view of its utilization, in view of tagrea, as the would say, useful things. Whether we are talking about technology, economy, medicine, psychosociology, or military power, and in fact we are talking about all of these at once, there is doubtless greater sensitivity to this problem in countries where the politics of research depend closely upon state-managed or nationalized structures. But I believe that con conditions are becoming more and more homogeneous among all the technologically advanced industrial industrialized societies. We speak of oriented research, where not so long ago we spoke as per speak of application. But it is growing more and more obvious that without being immediately applied or applicable, research may pay off, be usable, and oriented in more or less different ways. And what is at stake is not merely what sometimes used to be called the techno-economic, medical or military byproducts of pure research. The details, delays and relays of orientation, finalization, its random aspects as well, are more disconcerting than ever. Hence the attempt, by every possible means, to take them into account, to integrate them to the rational calculus of programmed research. A term like 
orient finalize is preferred to apply applique in addition because the word is less utilitarian it leaves open the possibility that novel aims may be written into the program you may wonder what is being advocated in France in opposition to this concept of oriented research the answer is basic research fundamental fundamental research distinguished disinterested research with aims that would not be pledged in advance to some <coughs> utilitarian purpose. Once upon a time, it was possible to believe that pure mathematics, theoretical physics, philosophy, and within philosophy, especially metaphysics or, and ontology, were basic disciplines, shielded from power, inaccessible to, uh, to programming by the pressures of the state or under cover of the state by civil society or capital interests. The sole concern of such basic research would be knowledge, truth, the disinterested exercise of reason under the sole authority of the principle of reason. And yet, we know better than ever, better than ever before, what must have been true for all time, that this opposition between the basic and the end oriented is of real but limited relevance. It is difficult to maintain this opposition with thoroughgoing conceptual as well as practical rigor, especially in the modern fields of the formal sciences, theoretical physics, chemistry, molecular biology, astrophysics, considered a remarkable example of the science of astronomy which is becoming useful after having been for so long in the paradigm of disinterested contemplation. Within each of these fields, and they are more interrelated than ever, the so-called basic philosophical <coughs> questions no longer simply take the form of abstract, sometimes epistemological questions raised after the fact. They arise at the, they arise at the very heart of scientific research in the widest variety, variety of ways. One can no longer distinguish between technology on the one hand and theory, science and rationality on the other. The term technoscience has to be accepted and its acceptance confirms the fact that an essential affinity ties together objective knowledge, the principle of reason and a certain metaphysical determination of the relation to truth. We can no longer, and this is finally what Heidegger recalls and calls on us to think through, we can no longer dissociate the principle of reason from the very idea of technology in the realm of their modernity. One can no longer maintain the boundary that Kant, for example, sought to establish between the schema that he called technical and the one he called architectonic in the systematic organization of knowledge, which was also to ground a systemat systematic organization of the university. The architectonic is the art of systems, says Kant. Under the government of reason, our knowledge in general, Kant says, should not form a rhapsody, but it must form a system in which alone it can support and favor the essential aims of reason. Unquote. To that pure rational unity of the architectonic, Kant opposes the schema of the merely technical unity that is empirically oriented according to views and ends that are incidental, not essential. For the end of reason that gives rise to fundamental science versus the incidental and empirical ends which can be systematized only in terms of technical schemas and necessities. Today, in the orientation of finalization, finalization of research, forgive me to, for presuming to, to recall such obvious points, it is impossible to distinguish between these two sets of aims. It is impossible, for example, to distinguish programs that one would like to consider worthy or even technically profitable for humanity, 
from other programs that could be destructive. This is not new, of course, but never before has so-called basic scientific research been so deeply committed to aims that are, at the same time, military aims. The very, the very essence of the military, the limits of military technology, and even the limits of its accountability, are no longer defined. When we hear that $2 million a minute, a minute are being spent in the world today for armaments, we may assume that this figure represents simply the cost of weapons manufacturing. But military investments do not stop at that. For military power, even police power, and more generally speaking, the entire defensive or of and offensive security establishment benefits from more than just the byproducts of basic research. In the advanced technological societies, these establishments, programs, orients, orders, and finances directly or indirectly, through the state or otherwise, the frontline research that is apparently the least and oriented of all. This is all too obvious in such areas as physics, biology, medicine, biotechnology, bioprogramming, data processing, and telecommunications. We have only to mention telecommunications and data processing, processing to assess the extent of the phenomenon. The orientation of research is limitless. Everything in this area proceeds in view of technical and instrumental security. At the surface of war, of national and international security, research programs have to encompass the entire field of information, the stockpiling of knowledge, the workings, and thus also the essence of language, you know, all semiotic systems, translation, coding and decoding, the play of presence and absence, hermeneutics, <coughs> semantics, structural and generative linguistics, pragmatics, red rhetoric. I'm accumulating all these disciplines in a haphazard way on purpose, but I shall end with literature, poetry, the arts and fiction in general. The theory that has these disciplines as its object may be just as useful in ideological warfare, warfare as it is in experimentation with variables in all too familiar versions of the referential function. Such a theory may always be put to work in communication strategy, the theory of commands, the most refined military pragmatics of chessive utterances. By what token, for example, will it be clear that an utterance is to be taken as a common in the new technology of telecommunications? How are the new resources of simulation and simulacrum to be controlled, and so on? One can just as easily seek to use the theoretical formulation of sociology, psychology, and even psychoanalysis in order to refine what was called in France during the Indochinese War or Algerian Wars, the powers of psychological action, alternative with torture. From now on, so long as it has the means, a military budget can invest in anything at, at all in view of deferred profits. Basic scientific theory, the humanities, literary theory, and philosophy. The Department of Philosophy, which covered all this in the, in the 19th century, and which Kant thought ought to be kept and unavailable to any utilitarian purpose and to the, the orders of any power whatsoever in its search for, for truth, the Department of Philosophy can no longer lay claim to such autonomy. What is produced in this field can always be used. And even if it should remain useless in its results, in its productions, it can always serve to keep the masters of discourse busy, the experts, professionals of rhetoric, logic of philosophy, who might otherwise be applying their energy elsewhere. Or again, it may in certain situations secure an ideological bonus 
goddess of luxury and gratuitousness for a society that can afford it within certain limits. Furthermore, when certain random consequences of research are taken into account, it is always possible to have in view some eventual benefit that may ensue from an apparently useless research project in philosophy of the humanities, for example. The history of the sciences encourages researchers to integrate that margin of randomness into their centralized calculation. They then proceed to adjust the means at their disposal, the available financial support, and the distribution of credits. A state power, or the forces that it represents, no longer need to prohibit research or to censor discourse, especially in the West. It is enough that they can limit the means, can regulate support for protection, transmission, and diffusion. The machinery for this new censorship, in the broad sense, is much more complex and omnipresent than in Kant's day, for example, when the entire problematics and the entire topology of the university were organized around the exercise, the exercise of royal censorship. Today, in the Western democracies, that form of censorship has almost entirely disappeared. The prohibiting limitations sanctioned through multiple channels that are decentralized difficult to bring together into a system. The unacceptability of a discourse, the non-certification of a research project, the illegitimacy of a course offering are declared by evaluative actions. Studying such evaluations is, seems to me, one of the tasks most indispensable to the exercise of academic responsibility most urgent for the maintenance of its dignity. Within the university itself, forces that are apparently external to it, presses, foundations, the mass media, are intervening in an ever more decisive way. University presses, for instance, play a mediating role that entails the most serious responsibilities, since scientific criteria, in principle represented by the members, of the university corporation have to come to terms with many other aims. When the margin of randomness has to be narrowed, restrictions on support affect the disciplines that are the least profitable in the short run. And that provokes within the professions all kinds of effects, certain ones of which seem to have lost any direct relation to that causality which is itself still largely overdetermined. The shifting determination of the margin of randomness always depends upon the techno-economic situation of a society in its relation to the entire world arena. In the United States, for example, and this is not just one example among others, in the United States, without even mentioning the economic regulation that allows certain surplus values through the channel of uh, private foundations, among others, to sustain research or creative projects that are not immediately or apparently profitable. We also know that military programs, especially those of the Navy, can very rationally subsidize linguistic, semiotic, or anthropological investigations. These, in turn, are related to history, literature, and hermeneutics law, political science, psychoanalysis, and so forth. The concept of information, or informatization, is the most general operator here. It integrates the basic to the oriented, the purely rational to the technical, thus bearing witness to that original intermingling of the metaphysical and the technical. The value of form is not foreign to it. But let us drop this difficult point for now. In the Azad von Grund, Heidegger locates this concept of information understood and pronounced as in English, he says, at the time when he's putting America and Russia 
Russia side by side like two symmetrical and homogeneous continents of metaphysics as things. Information pronounced as in English, he says. In a he, 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 he locates this concept of information in a dependence upon the principle of reason as a principle of integral calculability. Even the principle of uncertainty, and he would have said the same thing on a certain, on a certain interpretation of undecidability. The principle of uncertainty continues to operate within the problematics of representation and of the subject-object relation. Thus, he calls this the atomic era, and quotes a book of popularization entitled We Shall Live Thanks to Atoms. We Shall Live Thanks to Atoms, with prefaces both by Otto Hahn, Nobel Prize winner and fundamentalist physicist, and Franz Josef Strauss, then Minister of National Defense. Information ensures the insurance of calculation and the calculation of insurance. In this, we recognize the period of the principle of reason. Leibniz, as Heidegger recalls, is considered to have been the inventor of life insurance. <laughs> in the form of information, in the Gestalt der Information, Heidegger says, the principle of reason dominates our entire Vorstellung, representation, and delineates a period for which everything depends upon the, deli the delivery of atomic energy. Delivery in German is Zustellung, you know, a word that also applies, as the Heidegger points out, to the delivery of mail. Yes. It belongs to the chain of Gestell, from the Stellen cluster, Vorstellen, Nachstellen, Zustellen, Sicherstellen, that characterizes technological modernity. Information, in this sense, is the most economical, the most rapid, and the clearest, univocal, eindeutig, stockpiling, recording, and communication, and communication of news. It must instruct men about the safeguarding, Sicherstellung, of what will meet their needs, Takreya, computer technology, data banks, artificial intelligences, translating machines, and so forth. All these are constructed on the basis of that instrumental determination of a calculable language. Information does not inform merely by delivering an information content. It gives form, informiert, formiert zugleich. It installs man in a form that permits him to ensure his mastery on Earth and beyond. All this has to be pondered as the effect of the principle of reason, or, put more rigorously, has to be analyzed as the effect of a dominant interpretation of that principle, of a certain emphasis in the way we heed its, we heed its sounds. But I have said that I cannot deal with the question of such stress here. It lies uh, outside the scope of my topic. What, then, is my topic? What do I have in view that has led me to present things as I have done so far? I have been thinking especially of the necessity to awaken or to resituate a responsibility in the university or in face of the university, whether one belongs to it or not. Those analysts who study the informative and instrumental value of language today are necessarily led to the very confines of the principle of reason thus interpreted. This can happen in any number of disciplines. But if the analysts end up, for example, <coughs> working on the structures of the simulacrum, simulacrum of, of literary fiction, on a poetic rather than an informative value of language, on the effects of undesirability, and so on, by that very token, they are interested in possibilities that arise <coughs> at the outer limits of the authority and the power of the principle of reason. On that basis, they may attempt to define new responsibilities 
in the face of the university's total subjection to the technologies of informatization. Not so as to refuse them. Not so as to counter to counter with some obscurantist, obscurantist irrationalism. And irrationalism like nihilism is a posture that is completely symmetrical to and that's dependent upon the principle of reason. The term of extravagance, the theme of <coughs> extravagance as an irrationalism, there is very clear evidence for that, for this. Dates from the period when the principle of reason was being formulated. Leibniz denounced, denounced it in his new, es new essays on human understanding. To raise these new questions may sometimes protect an aspect of philosophy and the humanities that has always resisted the influx of technical knowledge. It may also preserve the memory of what is much more deeply buried and ancient than the principle of reason. But the approach I'm um, advocating here is often felt by certain guardians of the humanities or of the positive sciences as a threat. It is interpreted as such by those who most often have never sought to understand the history and the system of norms, specifically their own institution, the deontology of their own profession. They do not wish to know how their discipline has been constituted, particularly in its modern professional form, since the beginning of the 19th century and under the watchful vigilance of the principle of reason. For the principle of reason may have obscurantist and nihilist effects. They can be seen more or less everywhere, in Europe and in America, among those who believe they are defending philosophy, literature and the humanities against these new modes of questioning that are also a new relation to language and tradition and tradition. A new affirmation, a new affirmation, a new ways of taking responsibility. We can easily see on which side of Scurantism and nihilism are lurking when on occasion great professors or representative of prestigious institutions lose all sense of proportion and control. On such occasions, they forget the principle that they claim to defend in their work and suddenly begin to heap insults, to say whatever comes into their heads on the subject of texts that they obviously have never opened or that they have encountered through a mediocre journalism that in other circumstances they would pretend to score. I have many examples in mind. It is possible to speak of this new responsibility that I have involved. It is possible to speak of it only by sounding the call to practice it. It would be the responsibility of a community of thought for which the frontier between basic and oriented research would no longer be secured or in, a, in any event not under the same conditions as before. I only call it a community of thought in the broad sense uh, rather than a community of research, of, sci of science, or philosophy, since these values are most often subjected to the unquestioned authority of a principle of reason. Now, reason is only one species of thought, which does not mean that thought is irrational. Such a community would interrogate the essence of reason and of the principle of reason, the values of the basic, of the principal radicality, of the arche in general. And it would attempt to draw out all the possible consequences of this questioning. It is not certain that such thinking can bring together a community or found an institution in the traditional sense of these words. What is meant by community and institution but must then be rethought. This thinking must also unmask, an infinite task, unmask all the uses of and orienting reason, the path by which apparently disinterested research can find itself indirectly reappropriated, reinvested by programs of all sorts. That does not mean that orientation 
is bad in itself, and that it must be combated, combated far from it. Rather, I'm defining the necessity for a new way of educating students that will prepare them to undertake new anali analysis in order to evaluate these ends and to choose when possible among them all. With some colleagues, I was asked last year by the French government to prepare a report in view of the creation of an international college of philosophy. I insisted in that report on stressing the dimension that in this context I am calling thought a dimension that is not reducible to technique, uh, nor to science, nor to philosophy. This international college would not only be a college of philosophy, but also a place where philosophy itself would be questioned. It would be open to types, types of research that are not perceived as legitimate today, or that are insufficiently developed in French or foreign institutions, including some research that could be called basic. But it would not stop here, there. We would go one step further, providing a place to work on the value and meaning of the basic, the fundamental, on its opposition to goal orientation, on the ruses of orientation in all its domains. In this, this report confronts the political, ethical, and juridical consequences of such an undertaking. I cannot go into more detail here without keeping you much too long. These new responsibilities cannot be purely academic. If they remain extremely difficult to assume, extremely precarious and threatened, it is because they must at once keep alive the memory of a tradition and make an opening beyond any problem that is towards what is called the future. And the discourse, the works, or the position taking that these responsibilities inspire as to the institution of science and research no longer stay solely from the sociology of knowledge, from sociology of politology. These disciplines are doubtless more necessary than ever. I would be the last to want to disqualify them. But whatever conceptual authority they may have, whatever axiomatics, whatever methodology, Marxist or neo-Marxist, Weberian or neo-Weberian, Mannheimian, some combination of these or something else entirely, they never touch upon that which in themselves continues to be based on the principle of reason and thus on the essential foundation of the modern university. They never question scientific normativity, beginning with the value of objectivity or of object objectivation, which governs and authorizes their discourse. Whatever may be their scientific value, and it may be considerable, these sociologies of the institution remain, in this sense, internal to the university, intra-institutional, controlled by the deep-seated standards even the problems or the space that, that they claim to analyze. These can be observed, among other things, in the rhetoric, the rights, the modes of presentation and demonstration that they continue to respect. Thus, I shall go so far as to say that the discourse of Marxism and psychoanalysis, including those of Marx and Freud, in as much as, in as much as, they are standardized by a project of scientific practice and by the principle of reason are intra-institutional in any event homogeneous with the discourse that dominates the university in the last analysis. And the fact that this discourse is occasionally preferred by people who are not professional academics changes nothing essential. It simply explains to a certain extent, to a certain extent, the fact that even when it claims to be revolutionary, this discourse does not always trouble the most conservative forces of the universe. Where, whether it is understood or, understood or not, it is enough that it does not threaten the fundamental axiomatics and the ontology of the institution, its rhetoric, 
its rights and procedures. The academic landscape easily accommodates such types of discourse, more easily within its economy and its ecology. However, when it does not simply exclude those who raise questions at the level of the foundation or non-foundation of the foundation of the university, the academy reacts much more fearfully to those that address sometimes the same questions to Marxism, to psychoanalysis, to the sciences, to philosophy, and to the humanities. It is not a matter simply of questions that one formulates while submit, sub submitting oneself, as I'm doing here, to the principle of reason, but also of preparing oneself thereby to transform the modes of writing, approaches to pedagogy, the procedures of academic exchange, the relation to languages, to other disciplines, to the institution in general, to its inside and its outside. Those who venture forth along this path, it seems to me, need not set themselves up in opposition to the principle of reason, nor did they give way to irrationalism. They may continue to assume within the university along with its memory and tra tradition, the imperative of professional rigor and competence. This is a double gesture here, yeah. here a double postulation, we would say double by, to ensure professional competence and the most serious tradition of the university, even while going as far as possible, theoretically and practically, in the most directly underground thinking about the abyss beneath the university. It is this double gesture that appears insituable and thus unbearable to certain university professionals in every country who join ranks to foreclose or to censure it by all available means, simultaneously denouncing the professionalism and the anti-professionalism of those who are calling others to these new responsibilities. I shall not venture here to deal with the debate on professionalism that is developing in your country. Its features are, to a certain extent at least, specific to the history of the American University. But I shall conclude on this general theme of professions. At the risk of contradicting what I have been urging here, I should like to caution against another kind of precipitous reaction. For the responsibility that I'm trying to situate cannot be simple. It implies multiple sides, a stratified terrain, postulations that are undergoing continual displacement, a sort of strategic rhythm. I said earlier that I would be speaking only of a certain rhythm, for example, that of the blinking of the eye of an eye, and that I would only be playing one risk of against other, another, the barrier against the abyss, the abyss against the barrier, the one with the other and the one under the other. Beyond technical goal orientation, even beyond the opposition between technical goal orientation and the principle of sufficient reason, beyond the affinity between technology and metaphysics, what I have here called thought, risks in its turn, and I believe this risk is unavoidable, it is the risk of the future itself, risks in its turn being reappropriated by socio-political forces that could find it in their own interest in certain situations. Such a thought, indeed, cannot be produced outside of certain historical, techno-economic, political political institutional and linguistic conditions. A strategic analysis that is to be as vigilant as possible must thus, with its eyes wide open, attempt to wall off such reappropriations. And I should have liked to situate at this point certain questions about the politics of Heideggerian thought, especially as elaborated prior to the Sassen Grund for example, in the two inaugural discourses of 1909 and 1933. I shall limit myself, however, to the double question of professions. First, does the university have 
as its essential mission that of producing professional competencies, which may sometimes be external to the university. Second, it is the task of the university to ensure within itself and under what conditions the reproduction of professional competence by preparing professors for pedagogy and for research who have respect for a certain code. One may answer the second question in the affirmative without having done so for the first, and seek to keep professional forms and values internal to the university, outside the marketplace, while keeping the goal orientation of social work outside of the university. The new responsibility of the thought of which was speaking cannot fail to be accompanied at least by a movement of suspicion, even of rejection, with respect to the professionalization of the university in these two senses, and especially in the first, which regulates university life according to the supply and demand of the marketplace and according to a purely technical idea of competence. To this extent, at least, such thought may at a minimum result in reproducing a highly traditional politics of knowledge. And the effects may be those that belong to social hierarchy in the exercise of techno-political power. I am not saying that this thought is identical with that politics and it is therefore necessary to abstain from it. I am saying that under certain conditions it can serve that politics and that everything does come down to the analysis of those conditions. In modern times, Kant, Nietzsche, Heidegger and numerous others have all said as much quite unmistakably. They have said that the essential feature of academic responsibility must not be professional education. And the pure core of academic autonomy, the essence of the university, is located in the philosophy department, according to Kant. Does this affirmation not repeat the profound and hierarchizing political evaluation of metaphysics? I mean, of Aristotle's metaphysics. Shortly after the passage, that I read at the beginning, one sees a theoretical political hierarchy being put in place. At the top, there is theoretical knowledge. It is not thought after in view of its utility. And the holder of this knowledge, which is always a knowledge of causes and of principles, is the leader or architecton of society at work. He is positioned above the manual laborer who acts without knowing, just as fire burns. Now, this theoretical leader, this knower of causes, who has no need of practical skill, is, in essence, a teacher. Beyond the fact of knowing causes and of possessing, possessing reason, the logon AK, he bears another mark, semeion, another sign of recognition, the, the capacity to teach. To dynastai didaskai, to teach them and at the same time to direct, steer, organize the empirical work of the laborers. The theoretician teacher or architect is a leader because he is on the side of the arche, a beginning and commanding. He commands, he is the premier or the prince, because he knows causes and principle, principles, the whys and thus also the wherefores of things. Before the fact and before anyone else, he answers to the principle of reason, which is the first principle, the principle of principles. And that is why he takes order from the one. It is he, on the contrary, who orders, prescribes, lays down the law. And it is normal that this superior science, with the power that it confers by virtue of its very lack of utility, is developed in places, to poi, in regions where leisure is possible. Thus Aristotle points out that the mathematical arts were developed in Egypt owing to the leisure time enjoyed by the priestly caste, to ton yereo etnos, the priestly form. Kant, Nietzsche and Heidegger 
speaking of the university, pre-modern or modern, do not say exactly what I was saying, nor do all these, all three of them say exactly the same thing, but they also do say the same thing. Even though he admits the industrial model of the division of labor into the university, Kant places the so-called lower, lower faculty, faculty of philosophy, a place of pure rational knowledge, a place where truth has to be spoken without controls and without concern for utility, a place where the very meaning and the autonomy of the university meet, can place this faculty above and outside professional education. The architectonic schema of pure vision is above and outside the technical schema. And the state cannot intervene in the faculty of philosophy in principle. This is more complicated than in the university. In his lectures on the future of our educational establishments, Nietzsche condemns division of labor in the sciences, condemns utilitarian and journalistic culture in the service of the state, condemns the professional ends of the university. As for Heidegger, in 1929, in his phenomenal lesson, What is Metaphysics? He deplores the henceforth technical organization of the university and its departmentalizing specialization. And even in his rectal speech, 1933, at the very point where he makes an appeal on behalf of the three services, Arbeinsdienst, Wehrdienst, Wissensdienst, service of work, military service, knowledge, service of knowledge, at the very point where he's recalling that these services are of equal rank and equally original, and he had recalled earlier that for the Greeks, theoria was only the highest form of praxis and the mode par excellence of energia. Heidegger nevertheless, nevertheless, violently condemns disciplinary compartmentalization and, quote, exterior training in view of a profession as, quote, an idle and inauthentic thing. Desiring to remove the university from useful programs and from professional ends, one may always, willingly or not, find oneself serving unrecognized ends, reconstituting power of, powers of caste, class, or corporation. We are in an implacable political topography. One step further, in view of greater profundity or radicalization, even going beyond the profound and the radical, the principle, the archy, one step further toward a sort of original anarchy risks producing or reproducing the hierarchy. Thought requires both the principle of reason and, and what is beyond the principle of reason, beyond the archy and not. Between the two, the difference of a breath or an accent. Only the enactment of this thought can decide. That decision is always risky. It always risks the worst. To claim to eliminate that risk by an institutional program is quite simply to erect a barricade against the future. The decision of thought cannot be an intra-institutional event, an academic event. All this does not define politics, nor even a responsibility, only at best some negative conditions, a negative wisdom, as the count of the conflicted faculties would say, negative wisdom, preliminary cautions, protocols of visions for a new art clear, what must be seen and kept in sight in the modern re-elaboration of that old problem matters. Beware of the abysses and the gorges, but also of the bridges and the barriers. Beware of what opens the university to the outside and the bottomless, but also of what closing it in on itself would create only an illusion of closure, would make the university available to any sort of interest, or else render it perfectly useless. Beware of ends, but what would be a university without ends? Neither in its medieval nor in its modern form 
had the university dispose freely of its own absolute autonomy and of the rigorous conditions of its own unity. During more than eight centuries, university has been the name given by a society to a sort of supplementary body that at one and the same time it wanted to protect outside itself and to keep jealousy to itself, to emancipate and to control. On this double basis, the university was supposed to represent society. And in a certain way, it has done so. It has reproduced society's scenario, its views, conflicts, contradictions, its play and its differences, and also its desire for organic union in a total body. Organicist language is always associated with techno-industrial language in modern discourse on the university. But with the relative autonomy of a technical apparatus, indeed that of a machine and of a prosthetic body, this artifact, that is the university, has reflected society only in giving it the chance for reflection, that is also for dissociation. The time for reflection here signifies not only that the internal rhythm of the university apparatus is relatively independent of social time and relaxes the urgency of command, ensures for it a great and precious freedom of growth, an empty place for chance, and the imagination for a, of an inside part. The time for reflection is also the chance for turning back on the very conditions of reflection in all the senses of that word, as if with the help of a new optical device one could finally see sight, view viewing, as if through an acoustical device one could hear hearing, in other words, see the inaudible, the inaudible in a sort of poetic telephone. Then the time of reflection is also another time. It is heterogeneous with what it reflects and perhaps gives time for what calls for and is called thought. It is a chance for an event about which one does not know whether or not presenting itself within the university, it belongs to the history of the universe. It may also be brief and paradoxical. It may tear up time, like the instant invoked by Kierkegaard, one of the thinkers, of those thinkers who are foreign, even hostile to the university, but who give us more to think about with respect to the essence of the university than academic reflection to themselves. The chance for the event is the chance of an instant, an argument, a wink, or a blink. It takes place in the twinkling of an eye, you say, rather in the twilight of an eye. For it is the most crepuscular, the most westerly situations of the Western university that the chances of this twinkling of thought are multiplied. In a period of crisis, as we say, a period of decadence and renewal, when the institution is on the blink, provocation to think brings together in the same instant the desire for memory and expo exposure to the future, the fidelity of a guardian faithful enough to want to keep even the chance of a future. In other words, the singular responsibility of